Turn in your Bibles this morning to Leviticus chapter 1, Leviticus, the third book in our Bibles. We will also be putting the words up on the screens in front of you uh, in case you're looking at a different translation. Um, We do always encourage you to be reading the word for yourself. We are looking at the first chapter of Leviticus this morning. I'm going to read it in its entirety. It's 17 verses, which is not quite as long as it sounds. Listen then to the word of the Lord, Leviticus chapter 1. The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Then he shall kill the bull before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and throw the blood against the sides of the altar that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Then he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces, and the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. And Aaron's sons, the priest, shall arrange the pieces and the head and the fat and the wood that is on the fire on the altar. But its entrails and its legs he shall wash with water, and the priest shall burn all of it on the altar as a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma. If his gift for a burnt offering is from the flock, from the sheep or the goats, he shall bring a male without blemish, and he shall kill it on the north side of the altar before the Lord. And Aaron's sons, the priest, shall throw its blood against the sides of the altar, and he shall cut it into pieces with its head and its fat, and the priest shall arrange them on the wood that is on the fire on the altar. But the entrails and the legs he shall wash with water, and the priest shall offer all of it and burn it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. If his offering to the Lord is a burnt offering of birds, then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or pigeons, and the priest shall bring it to the altar and wring off its head and burn it on the altar. Its blood shall be drained out on the side of the altar, and he shall remove its crop with its contents and cast it beside the altar on the east side in the place for ashes. He shall tear it open by its wings, but shall not sever it completely, and the priest shall burn it on the altar on the wood that is on the fire. It is a burnt offering, a food offering, a pleasing aroma to the Lord." Just what you expected this morning when you came to a Sunday morning church service, right? This summer, there were several times when you walked out the front door of your, of your house and you were, in count, you, you, you were confronted with the haze of smoke that had drifted south from the Canadian wildfires, right? Or, or especially if you got onto I-90 going towards Cleveland or really just anywhere where you had a, a large view without large trees or, or buildings obstructing your view. You saw this, this low haze of smoke sitting on the landscape, and sometimes you could smell the wood smoke, right? I was thinking about that this week as I was reading and preparing for this message. I, I think it wouldn't have been quite unlike that for the Israelites in the camp of Israel with the tabernacle, the tent of meeting there at the center, as they offered daily these burnt offerings, and the smoke of them went up to heaven constantly. And depending on which way the breeze drifted, it would settle over the camp. Imagine yourself in Israel, like coming out of your tent every day, every morning, and immediately smelling the smoke of the burnt offering, seeing it in the air, and remembering this truth. It was an inescapable truth that this burnt offering was offered in the place of you, Entirely burnt up, a reminder that everything belongs to God. That's what we're seeing this morning when we consider this this burnt offering, that God's people are those who recognize that everything belongs to God. Not only all that we have, but also all that we are. Let's leave that up on the screen for just a little bit as I continue on with this introduction. I've I've heard that uh, we take that off the screen too soon for those who like to take notes to write it down. So... We'll leave it up there for for a few more minutes. That idea is what we're going to be presenting to you this morning as we work our way through this chapter. God's people are those who recognize that everything belongs to him. Not only all that we have, but even everything that we are. This chapter opens, as we saw last week, with God speaking to Moses from inside the tabernacle. Moses is outside the tabernacle, outside the tent of meeting, which is unusual. Moses has been used to going in and speaking to God directly, but now the Shekinah glory of God, the dwelling presence of God, the fire and the smoke have descended on the tent of meeting, and Moses can't get in. 
And that illustrates to him and to us the whole problem of separation between God and humanity, that humans cannot approach God in his holiness without being consumed. And it's that problem of separation that this book of Leviticus is going to work towards solving. It's probably worth noting, too, as we begin this study of the burnt offering, that the Hebrew word that's translated burnt in, in this, in this uh, chapter of Leviticus is the Hebrew word ola, not to be confused with the Spanish word for hello, but this is a word ola, which in Hebrew always refers to going up. Every place it's used other than in reference to this sacrifice, it refers to getting up, standing up, going up from a valley to a mountaintop. It's a word that means ascension or rising up. And so some translators even translate this not as burnt offering, but as ascension offering. And of course, that might refer simply to the fact that when the offering is burnt on the altar, the smoke ascends to heaven constantly. It might just be a reference to that. But I suspect that it's something else than that. I suspect it's a reference to the fact that in the end, everything goes back to God. In the end, everything belongs to God, including we ourselves. The burnt offering is first in this list of offerings. We mentioned last week that there are five major offerings that are talked about in the first seven chapters of Leviticus, and we're going to work our way through all of them over the course of the next couple of months as we go through Leviticus. The burnt offering, though, is first in the list because it is the most frequent offering that the Israelites practiced. If we went back into the book of Exodus, we would see in Exodus 29 that God commands that the burnt offering be offered twice a day just as a foundation, just as a minimum for the offerings. Listen to these words from Exodus 29. This is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs a year old, one uh, day by day regularly. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. It shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord. And so we see right at the beginning that this burnt offering, in in addition to being combined with other offerings, as we're going to see, and in addition to being offered at any time that a person just wanted to offer a burnt offering, it was mandated to be offered a minimum of twice a day, which leads to the conclusion, as many commentators have pointed out, as the Israelite historians have told us, that there was a constant offering, a constant burning, a constant smoke rising from the altar in the middle of the camp of Israel. A constant reminder that everything is God's, including we ourselves. This morning, as we talk about the burnt offering, we're going to talk, first of all, about the picture that the offering paints. Then we're going to talk about the posture that it conveys. We'll talk about the pattern that it lays out for us and the person whom it all foreshadows. The picture, the posture, the pattern, and the person. We're going to spend most of our time on the first two of those points. I tell you that so that by the time we get through point number two, and you're looking at your watches, you'll realize we're going to go through the last two points fairly quickly, and you won't lose heart. All right. God's people are those who recognize that everything belongs to God, not only all that we have, but also all that we are. Consider then the picture that this offering paints for us. And to do that, I want to lay before you four observations that come to us out of these verses. The first observation is that there are three levels of burnt offering specified. So if you're paying attention, as we read through these verses, you notice that, that there is an option for offering a burnt offering from the herd, cattle, that is in verses 3 through 9. And then there's the option for offering a burnt offering from the flock, a sheep or a goat, that's spoken of in verses 10 through 13. And then there's the option for offering a bird, that's spoken of in verses 14 through 17. Three options, three levels of sacrifice, if you want to think about it that way. And then you have to ask yourself, well, why is that? Why does God give these three options for this burnt offering? And the answer, I think, is fairly simple. And that is that God understands that this might potentially be a very costly thing that not everybody can afford. Maybe you're very wealthy and you can afford to offer a bull, but maybe you're not quite as wealthy. Maybe you don't have a herd at your disposal, or if you have a herd, you can't afford to give up a bull for the offering, and so the option is there to to offer something from your flock. But maybe you don't even have a flock. And so God says, here's a third option. You can just offer a bird. And the point of this, of course, if if you can let your mind go free from the concerns about animal cruelty that invade our modern minds and place yourself back in the place of the ancient Israelites, you'll realize very very simply and easily that God is saying to his people, you do not have to be wealthy to come to me. You don't have to be concerned about placing your family in jeopardy by giving up the most expensive thing in your life. 
you can just come with a very simple offering. God is not a respecter of persons, brothers and sisters. He cares about everyone, the wealthy and the impoverished alike. He does not care more for one than the other. And it's worth noting, too, that as you go through those three options, the option from the herd and from the flock and the birds, all three of them are said to result in a pleasing aroma, a soothing aroma to the Lord. That is to say, God is equally pleased by all of them. He's not more pleased by one than the other. So the first observation here is that God cares for his people. He cares for their financial well-being. The second observation that we can see as we look at these verses is the requirements for the burnt offering that are specified here. There are two main requirements for the burnt offering. You notice them in verse 3 and in verse 10. He says, you shall bring a male without blemish. There they are. Those are the two requirements. The offering had to be a male animal and it had to be an animal that had no blemish on it. Why did it have to be male? Commentators spill a lot of ink in describing why that may have been the case, but I think the simplest answer is probably the best. Males in, in herd uh, or in, in food animal populations like that are always more valuable than the females. They certainly were in that day and age, but they are uh, even today. The uh, reasons for that go beyond our, our scope of our conversation this morning, but, but in just the cursory research that I did in preparation for this message, I learned that in, in food animal populations, the ratio of females to males is generally as high as 10 to 1, 10 females for every male, which all by itself shows you that males uh, are more valuable, as well as in their ability to, to procreate for the flock and for the good of the herd, which is as much as to say that God is saying you have to bring the more valuable option. You bring the more valuable option, a male. It is to be male. It's, it's to be without blemish, God says. It's to have no, no blemish on it, no spot. That is to say, it can't be an animal with a broken leg or a, a running sore or some kind of disease. It has to be healthy and vibrant. Or to put it another way, God is saying you can't just get rid of any animal that you want to get rid of by making it a burnt offering. It's not just a convenient way for you to dispose of animals that aren't good for your, your prosperity. God says it has to be a healthy animal. Actually, as I was thinking about this this week, I was reminded of, of people who tend to bring all of their cast-off furniture and things to the church. You know, you replace your sofa, and you say, well, maybe the church wants my old sofa. Maybe the church wants my old TV now that I get a bigger screen or something, right? I don't, none, none of you ever do that, right? That doesn't happen. Stepping on toes here this morning. Uh, with very few exceptions, I can tell you we don't want your old stuff. It's, it's, it's a principle at work here. God is saying to the Israelites, if it's not good enough for you, it's not good enough for me either. This isn't just a convenient way for you to get rid of stuff. And so we can look at these two requirements and see their practical reasons there. But I suspect there's even a more deep reason that underlies these two requirements, that the offerings be male and unblemished. And at the risk of, of tipping my hand too early, we're going to talk more about this when we get to the person who all of this foreshadows, it's impossible through the lens of the gospel not to see what's being symbolized here. What's being symbolized is the final burnt offering, the final offering for sin, the eternal man who is without blemish and spot, Jesus Christ. So two observations so far. We see the, the levels of burnt offering specified. We observe these two requirements for the burnt offering. But as we continue to paint this picture for you, I want you to consider another observation. Consider the frequency with which the burnt offering is employed. We've already mentioned that it was offered twice a day as a very foundation for their offering system, morning and evening. The effect being that there was nearly constantly an animal being burned in the court of the tabernacle. But as we go forward through Leviticus, we're going to see that the burnt offering is frequently employed elsewhere as well. In chapter 3, we're going to see that the burnt offering is offered in conjunction with the peace offering to give thanks to God and initiate a feast of thanksgiving with others. In chapter 5, we'll see that the burnt offering is offered in conjunction with the sin offering, the purification offering, to atone for the guilt of sin. In chapter 12, we're going to see that it's offered in conjunction with the purification offering as part of the purification process following the uncleanness resulting from childbirth. And in chapter 14, we'll see that it's offered in conjunction with the purification offering and grain offering as part of the purification process from the uncleanness of leprosy. 
And in chapter 15, we'll see that the burnt offering is offered in conjunction with the sin offering as part of the purification process from general uncleanness. And then in chapter 16, on the Day of Atonement, we'll see the purification offered a couple of other times as well. It's offered once for the priest as an individual, and it's offered a second time for the congregation of Israel as a whole. And then in chapter 23, we'll see the purific- that the burnt offering along with the grain offering. And in chapter 23, verse 18, we'll see it's offered on the Feast of Weeks along with the grain offering, a sin offering, and a peace offering. Over and over again, the burnt offering is given. It's, sometimes it's standalone, sometimes it's in combination with other offerings. But the result of this is that the burnt offering is constantly being offered. There's constantly an animal that's being butchered and burnt up on the altar. The smoke rises continually. The burnt offering then is the single most common offering that the Israelites sacrificed. Understand that the Israelites, uh, by the time Jesus comes on the scene in in, in 2,000 years or 1,400 years after this, that Moses writes this, the Israelites had come to understand themselves as a nation as the offering. The burnt offering was offered in place of them. They were the offering, as it were. They associated themselves with the burnt offering so closely because it was offered continually. Fourth observation in terms of this picture that the offering paints is the process itself. Consider what the Israelites went through as they made this offering. The individual worshiper comes with the animal for the burnt offering, whichever animal it is. And the first thing we read is that he lays his hands on it. In fact, the translation there is a little bit weak. The reality is not just that he places his hands on the head of the animal that's going to be offered. The the idea there, the, the language is that he pushes down on its head. And in the case of the burnt offering that's associated with the sin offering, uh, the idea is that he's going to confess the guilt of the sin, the particular sins that have been committed, with the idea being that the weight of the guilt of the sin is being transferred from him to the animal. But even in cases where the burnt offering is not associated with, with the guilt of sin, there is, there is supposed to be a statement of why the animal is being brought. Maybe it's being brought as a statement of thanksgiving to God for his provision, or in fulfillment of a vow, but in any case, there is this right of transference, as it were, a statement that this animal is mine, and it stands in my place. And then, God says, according to verse 4, it will be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Friends, this is one of the things that lies at the bottom of all of this talk of sacrifice. This is so foreign to us, isn't it? We don't understand any of this sacrifice language. In fact, to us, it smacks of animal cruelty at at worst or, or, or just needless bloodthirstiness. But what stands at the root of it is this idea that we need a substitute, a stand in for us. After the worshiper lays his hand on the animal, it says uh, he does all the work. The person bringing the animal does the work. Uh, Verse 5, it says, then he shall kill the bull before the Lord. Understand, it is the individual worshiper who does this. He slaughters the animal. He skins it. He quarters it. He washes the entrails and the legs. I'll let you figure out what the purpose of that is. This is stuff that you expected to talk about on a Sunday morning at church, right? All this dirty work is done by the worshiper who brings the animal. The job of the priest in all this is to collect the blood and to oversee the burning of the flesh. Throughout the slaughtering process, it was the priest who handles all the blood. In various cases, it's poured out in some places. It's it's sprinkled on the altar in other cases. And the reason for this is told to us later on in Leviticus. The life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. God is is saying to his people, it all belongs to me. I'm the one in charge of all of it. Life is mine. And then the priest is going to oversee the burning of the animal. It's burned in its entirety, apart from its skin. This isn't emphasized here in this chapter, but if you get to chapter 7, verse 8, you find out that the skin of these burnt animals was reserved for the priest. The burnt offering was such a frequent occurrence in Israel that when they were observing these laws properly, there would never have been a moment when there was not smoke rising from the altar of burnt offering. There would have been a constant haziness 
just as we experienced from those Canadian wildfires this summer, a constant haziness, not to mention the smell around the precincts of the tabernacle. Uh, many commentators have pointed out that going to the tabernacle would not just have been something that you saw, you would have smelled it before you saw it. Same with the, the temple in Jerusalem later on in redemptive history. A constant reminder of the fact that all things belong to God. Not just a portion, but the whole. So what did all this accomplish? The constant offering of substitutionary sacrifices, animals in the place of people, served to remind the people of their proper posture before God, that they belonged by divine right to God, and that all they had belonged to Him, not just a portion, but the entirety. Their burnt offering necessarily contributed to a posture toward God, and that's what we want to talk about next, the posture. In order to understand this posture, we have to understand the offering's purpose. What exactly was the purpose of the burnt offering? It's true that the burnt offering is closely associated with atonement for sin. And so in verse 4, it says the person will be accepted before the Lord. And the offering will be accepted for him to make atonement for him. And it is therefore frequently used in conjunction with the purification sin offering and with the guilt offering. But in general, I think the burnt offering is about something much bigger than that. The burnt offering seems to be about more than just atonement for sin. It is a recognition that all of life, all of the worshiper is entirely in God's hands. The reason the entire animal, apart from the skin, is consumed on the altar is meant to be a symbol of the fact that the entire worshiper and all the worshiper has belongs to God. That we have to give, in the end, all that we have and all that we are to God, not just a portion of it. We know, though, that if a human approaches God, the result will be total annihilation. God has made that clear over and over again in the earlier chapters and earlier books of this series. In Genesis and in Exodus, we see that God cannot have humans approach Him because of His glory. The nature of His glory, His magnitude, His awfulness is so great that human beings will be consumed. Remember when God comes down in fury and fire and light on Mount Sinai, He says, don't come up to the mountain. Even Moses, who is allowed up to the top of the mountain, when he asks to see the glory of God, God says, I can't show you the glory. You'll be consumed. That's the reality. That's the problem. Human beings cannot approach God. We belong to Him. Reality, in that sense, will not be satisfied unless we are entirely in God's presence, and yet we cannot be in God's presence without being consumed. And so God's solution, then, is a substitution a substitute, an animal that is offered in our place. It would have been impossible, I think, to miss the symbolism as you watched the bull or the sheep or even just the bird dying and the carcass being burned up entirely, consumed entirely on the altar. It would have been impossible to miss the, the symbolism that that ought to be you. You ought to be there. And in a sense, you need to be. You need to be consumed entirely by God. And it would have led to this question in your heart, how can I be consumed by God without ceasing to exist? It's the problem that the Bible seeks to solve. This symbolism explains the burnt offering's close association with frequent combination with other offerings. The extent to which other offerings have value is precisely the extent to which the symbolism of the burnt offering holds true. That is to say, if a person is not entirely given to God in their heart, then the other sacrifices don't matter. So in that sense, the burnt offering is the foundation of everything else. Or, to put it another way, if a person is not entirely given to God in the same way that the burnt offering is entirely consumed on the altar, then nothing else you do matters. That's true for the ancient Israelites, and it's true for us. We must be entirely given to God, or else nothing else matters. Nothing else will please God. Only a total devotion will be to him a pleasing aroma. The larger understanding of the burnt offering in this way becomes a symbol of total devotion to the Lord. And we see it coming out in that way in other places in redemptive history as well. So we can go back in Genesis to chapter 22 and see that famous story where Abraham is told to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. And of course he doesn't. There's a, a ram substituted at the last minute. God is never pleased by human sacrifice, never commands it. He makes that clear to his people over and over again. 
But that's called a burnt offering. And what is that except a, a picture of total commitment to God, total devotion to God? When the Israelites enter into the covenant at Sinai and they offer offerings of thanksgiving and peace offerings, they offer also burnt offerings. They're symbols of their total commitment to God, their commitment to being in this perfect relationship with God. When Elijah, in the contest on Mount Carmel, has the, the contest with the prophets of Baal and, and, the, and the offerings prepared there on the altar and he calls down fire from heaven, that's called a burnt offering. It's a picture of total commitment to God. Will we belong to God? Will we give ourselves to God entirely? Or will we compromise and also serve the false gods? In fact, I would even argue that the requirement that the burnt offering be included in the purification for various uncleanness, most specifically the uncleanness following childbirth, which we'll talk about on a later date, is a symbol of the very same thing. It's a, it's a way of saying this child that was just born belongs entirely to God. But we're going to offer this burnt offering in its place. Now, we might read all this, or consider all this, and wonder why was this all necessary? Why kill an innocent animal? But I think the slaughter of the animal brought home to the worshiper the weight of just how much they owed to God, whether they were bringing it in response to their own sin or for reasons of thanksgiving or in fulfillment of a vow. It served to remind the worshiper that their relationship with God was a serious thing, both in terms of the poignancy of watching an animal die and in terms of the actual monetary cost to the person bringing the offering. With that understanding, when we read that these offerings served as a pleasing aroma to the Lord, we understand that that phrase means it speaks less to the idea of the actual smell of the offering and more to the spiritual symbolism of it. Indeed, I think when you think about the actual smell that the Israelites would have experienced as these burnt offerings were slowly consumed, the smell probably changed over the course of the offering, right? When it started, it probably would have smelled good, like an outdoor barbecue, right? Or a roast in the oven, a sheep or a, or a cow. But as it progressed, I don't think it still would have smelled good. Imagine the roast that you put in the oven, turn it on high and leave it for hours and hours. And imagine the smoke filling the house. That doesn't smell good anymore. Right? I don't think that when it says this is a pleasing aroma to the Lord, it's talking primarily about the pleasantness of the smell. It's talking about the fact that this is symbolic of a right relationship with God. God is pleased. God is delighted when we are fully and completely devoted to him. The burnt offering helped the people of Israel adopt and remain in a posture of total abandonment to God. The inescapability, the ubiquity of the smoke of the burnt offering was a constant reminder that everything belongs to God and that we must, in the end, present all that we have and all that we are to him. Not just a little bit, but all. God's people are those who recognize that everything belongs to God. Not only all we have, but also all we are. This is the picture of the offering, and this is the posture that it recommends to us. But I want you to consider third the pattern that this offering lays out. Understand that when we talk about the pattern, we're talking about something that the scripture explains fully elsewhere. When, when uh, in Exodus, the design for the construction of the tabernacle and the ordination of the priests and the, and the construction of the priests' garments and everything, when all that instruction was given, God said to Moses two different times, he said, be careful to do everything according to the pattern I show you on the mountain. And then commenting on that, later on in the book of Hebrews, we read that all of that pattern was there to serve as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. In other words, all of this, all of this in Israel, the tabernacle and the priests and the offerings, all of it is a copy, a shadow, a foreshadowing, a symbol of eternal realities. So what is the pattern that we need to observe with this burnt offering? What are the things about this burnt offering that are later going to be used in the New Testament to describe the eternal truths? And I want to suggest to you four things, four elements to the pattern of the burnt offering. And then we'll see how those four things are fulfilled in the person to whom it points. 
The first element is this. The offering was to be without blemish, as we've already mentioned. That's, that's spoken of a couple of times in this chapter. And that fact, that description is picked up by the New Testament authors when they speak about the work of Jesus, as we will see. So keep that in your mind. The offering was to be without blemish. That's the first element of the pattern. The second element is that it's meant to provide a pleasing aroma, as we've just spoken of. That's going to be picked up by the New Testament authors as well. So keep that in your mind, a pleasing aroma. So number one, without blemish. Number two, a pleasing aroma. Number three, the offering had to be offered constantly. I've tried to emphasize that in a few different ways this morning. This offering is offered constantly, over and over again, day by day, hour by hour. Constant offering for sin, constant smoke rising to God. And then fourth, the offering was meant to symbolize that all we have and all we are belongs to God. In a very real sense, friends, I think we have to conclude from this and in conjunction with the rest of Scripture that reality will only be satisfied. The itch in your heart will only be satisfied if you are totally given to God, if you are totally consumed by God. Yet the problem is, that God is a consuming fire. So how can we have the need in our heart satisfied, the, the problem of reality satisfied without being entirely consumed and done away with? How can we approach God? This is the problem of Leviticus, the problem that Leviticus seeks to solve. And so all of that brings us then to the solution of the problem, the person to whom the pattern points, which is Jesus Christ. While it's true that we would be consumed by the fire of God's unapproachable glory, God has instead provided a substitute to stand in our place, Jesus Christ. Just as the burnt offering was totally consumed by fire, so Jesus was totally consumed for us. That's really what's happening on the cross, right? When Jesus is hanging on the cross and we see him dying for our sins and we hear him saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's him being consumed by the fire. That's him standing in our place. That's him being totally committed to God when we couldn't be. And yet, something else happens as Jesus is there on the cross, doesn't it? The burnt offering, on the, burnt, on the altar of burnt offering in Israel, first at the tabernacle, later at the temple precinct in Jerusalem, that animal was eventually consumed. It was done away with. The ashes were eventually swept up and cast out, right? But something else happened when Jesus became the burnt offering for our sins. Something else happened. He was consumed in a sense, yes, but because he is the eternal God, he's not just a perfect human. He is God in the flesh. He himself consumed the fire. He was consumed, but he also consumed. He extinguished it. He outlasted it. The fire in Jesus was put out. And so on the cross, he says, it is finished. It's done. The altar is no longer useful. The fire is now out. It's quenched and over with. Jesus not only was consumed in our place, but he consumed the hell that we deserve. He took it into himself and defeated it. Jesus is the true lamb without blemish and spot. This, this language of offering without blemish speaks ultimately of Jesus. And so Peter in 1 Peter 1.18 says, You were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but of the blood of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You see, Peter looks back at this, this language about the burnt offering here, and he says this is ultimately about Jesus Jesus is the lamb without blemish. Jesus is the one who is the final pleasing aroma. The burnt offering is a pleasing aroma to the Lord, but Paul in Ephesians says, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant aroma, a pleasing aroma and sacrifice to God. Jesus is the one final sacrifice. The burnt offering is offered up continually throughout Israel's history. The smoke goes up day after day forever and ever. But the author to the Hebrews says that he, Jesus, the true high priest, has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily 
first for his own sin and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself. You see, all of this, brothers and sisters, finds its culmination in Jesus Christ. All of it points forward to Jesus. He is the person to whom this offering points. This is why, by the way, we no longer offer sacrifices or anything else like it. You know, there, there are some branches of the church who, who have what I, I heard Al Mohler once call liturgical envy. They look at these stories of Israel in the Old Testament and they say, we need something like that. Sure, we can't offer animal sacrifices anymore, but we need something. We need the smells and the bells. We need the incense censers being waved back and forth to fill our, our, our rooms with smoke. We need something that's like this. No, we don't. We don't need any of that. It's all fulfilled in Christ. He is the end of the law for righteousness to those who believe. It all finds its fulfillment in him. It's over. The fire is extinguished. It's done. The sacrifice has been made. God's people are those who recognize this, who recognize that everything we have belongs to God and everything we are, a fact that is fulfilled for us in Christ. Now, there's one other point that I want to make for you this morning as we wrap things up and right before we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. There's one other point that I want to make. There is a moment in the life of Jesus when his identity as the true burnt offering is really driven home, and it occurs at the stage of his baptism. Do you remember the story of Jesus' baptism when he's baptized by John in the Jordan River? And it says, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended like a dove and there was a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Do you remember the voice of God from heaven? Did you realize when you read that story that God is deliberately echoing what he said to Isaac when he called, or what he said to Abraham when he called upon Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? Do you remember what God said to Abraham in Genesis 22? He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and offer him as a burnt offering. When God says that, and by the way, that's not the only place, is it, in, in, in Jesus' life, where we hear those words from heaven, this is my beloved son, this is my only begotten son, my only son whom I love. God is saying, this Jesus is like Isaac. But with Isaac, there was a substitution made, right? At the last minute, God showed Abraham a ram who was caught in the thicket, and he said, don't hurt your son. Sacrifice the ram instead. And the ram became the burnt offering in the story of Abraham and Isaac. But for Jesus, there is no substitute. Jesus is the substitute. He is the substitute for you and for me. Jesus is the true, the final burnt offering. That's what his death was all about. I invite you then to consider this reality as we prepare ourselves to, to enjoy, to celebrate, to observe the Lord's Supper this morning. 